afternoon. I am Reverend Lawrence Mosley. I'm the pastor here at Hope Missionary Baptist Church. And what we're going to be doing on today, we are going to be summing up what we've talked about when it comes to the to discipleship thus far and what we've talked about with the four spheres. And so in doing that, before we get started, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come now as humbly as we know how. Thanking you, Lord, for this another opportunity that you have allowed us to come together, even if it's virtually. Lord, I ask you to be in the midst of what is said. I ask that it be applicable to your people and be be a, a vessel to help equip the body of Christ. So we ask you to be with us now, Lord, as we dive into understanding more about discipleship. And it, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we started off with defining discipleship. Like I said, we're doing an overview on today. And what we wanted to do with the definition of discipleship is we wanted it to be biblical and we want it to be clear. So we looked for a biblical format and we looked at Matthew chapter four, verse 19, where Jesus said unto the, his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. These are the three key attributes to defining discipleship. Jesus says, follow me. This is a simple invitation from Jesus. He says, I will make you. These are words of transformation. Fishes of men. These three words in the verse indicate the response of action. To so and it's something that affects what we live for and what we do. We have to understand that if our acceptance of Jesus begins in the head and extends to the heart, it leads to a change in what we do with our hands. So we must understand as far as discipleship goes, that we are saved for a purpose. So when we kind of look at that and break that down, when the head is engaged, we must be committed to know the teachings of Jesus. We must be willing to surrender to Christ. We must be willing to spend time with Jesus so that we strengthen our, our lives, we strengthen our faith, we strengthen our lives, and we move in the direction that God is calling us to for our purpose. That's when the head is engaged. But when the heart is engaged, we have to ask ourselves, do we see visible change in our lives? We must be committed to doing the right things for the right godly reasons. There should be a change in our character. And there should be a consistent pattern of growth in our love for God and our love for one another. We should be moving by the aid of the Holy Spirit. Trusting Jesus in all humility for our salvation and our guidance daily. And daily, we should be striving to abide in him. And that is when the heart is engaged. When the hands are engaged, we must be willing to follow Christ in the direction he is leading us. We should be putting into practice what we are learning. And we should be desiring to be more like him. We should be concerned about the salvation of others and we should be using the gifts that God has given us to reconcile the lost to Jesus Christ. And we should be constantly developing our skill set. This is how we define discipleship and disciples are what we should be desiring to make. This requires a shift from simply being content to make converts and truly start reaching people in the discipleship process. Our goal as disciples should be to present people as mature believers in Christ. That should be our goal daily. And then we looked at the role of the leader in the discipleship process. 
And when we look at the role that the leader must play in the discipleship process, we look at the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. And the key words in this text for the leader is to go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. But see, if we are going to be effective as leaders in the discipleship process or in any process, we must be authentic. Authenticity is an agreement between who we really are and our actions. When there's a lack of harmony, this leads to a lack of genuineness in our leadership. To make it simple, if we are going to be leaders for Jesus Christ, we must keep it real. And when we keep it real, we acknowledge the fact that we are human. We are flawed. We are and we all have issues. However, we are striving to be honest and genuine in our approach to people. We are striving to be transparent. If someone is transparent, it means that the person cannot or does not hide or conceal anything. It means observers who want to know what is someone what someone is up to. All they have to do is observe you or me. And they know a person who is transparent has no secrets and tells no lies. We must understand as leaders, perfection will never happen. We must understand that we have to be maturing, but we will never be perfect. As a leader, we have to understand also when it comes to being authentic that we are walking in faith. We are forgiven by God. We are continually cleansed from sin. We are constantly maturing. We are striving to grow in Christ, but we are not perfect. See, we as church leaders, we want to experience joy in what we do and have real relationships with people. And we want to sustain those relationships. We want to use the right resources to do the right godly things and achieve our purpose. We want the church to produce lasting disciples of Jesus Christ. We want people's lives to genuinely be change for the glory of God. So as we're summing this up, we have to look at the characteristics that make a good godly leader. One must love God. A disciple must love God. That simply means that a disciple must be Christ focused and Christ centered. A disciple not only has to love God, but a disciple has to love people unconditionally. The key word there is unconditionally. We must strive to be transparent. And when we are transparent, we intentionally create an environment of safety for those we lead. As leaders, as disciples, we strive to walk in integrity. That means our talk matches our walk. Not only do we strive to walk in integrity, we strive to build with integrity. That means my words and my deeds match up. I am who I am, no matter where I am or who I am with. As leaders, we must be credible, not just clever. And I'll say that again as disciples, 
We must be credible and not just clever. We must strive to be authentic naturally and spiritually. We must be willing to serve and sacrifice for both God and people. So we understand the definition of being a disciple and we understand the expectations that we should have of ourselves as leaders in the disciple making process. But we must, as we sum it up, we have to understand the spheres of discipleship. The first sphere deals with our relationship with God. And we must understand within our relationship with God that we are adopted spiritual children of our heavenly father because of the gospel. We are not accidents. Our lives were planned before the beginning of time as we know it. We came to Jesus to be born again spiritually, even though we were dead in our sins. We are saved by grace through our faith to do good works that God predestined for us to do before time as we know it began. Our relationship with God should be growing. We should be nurturing our, our relationship with God day in and day out because it is the key point to every other sphere of discipleship. John 15 tells us that we must abide in Christ if we wish to bear fruit. So we, we have to understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be committed and devoted to Jesus Christ. We need to find ourselves wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in him. It is clear that this is our most important sphere. It is our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As branches connected to the vine, we receive direction from Jesus Christ through his word. We are strengthened from the Holy Spirit and we get help from one another. That's sphere one. Understand oh, that our relationship with Jesus is our most important relationship. But then there's sphere number two where we deal with our relationship with those in the church. If we look at Ephesians 4, we see that Paul, he shifts his focus from the central importance of our personal relationship with Christ and begins to discuss the effect of that relationship with Christ on our relationship with our brothers and our sisters. He said, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. That's a, that, that's a mouthful right there. He's saying we have been called to lead a life worthy of our calling. He says, always be humble and gentle. We're talking about our relationship with other believers. We are always to be humble and gentle with one another. I know sometimes it gets hard, but we have to refer back to the word. We are, we're talking, we've talked about the fact that our relationship with Christ is important. So we lean back on that relationship with Jesus Christ as we deal with our brothers and our sisters. Jesus is gentle and humble with us. We should be gentle and humble with our brothers and sisters. He also says, be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. And we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have our faults. We all have our shortcomings, but when we see those faults and shortcomings, we are to be humble, gentle, and meek with one another. 
And we have to make every effort to keep ourselves united together, binding ourselves together with peace. God wants the church to be unified. We have to remember that we are all in this together, whether it be church, whether it be a pandemic, whether it be any type of experience, we are all in this together. But what then we ask ourselves, uh, you know, because we are human, how how should we relate to other folk in the midst of what we deal with, in the midst of what we are going through? You have to live your life according to the word. The word says live your life worthy of the call that God has called you to. We are not worthy because of anything that we've done. We are worthy because of Jesus's sacrifice on Calvary and his victorious resurrection. That therefore, because it is not something that we do when we relate to other people, we have to relate to them so we can be relatable. We need to be relatable as people. And we do that by being humble and gentle. And we're patient. We're patient with one another. And we stay unified in peace. It, it makes no sense. Some of the stuff that we divide over in the church. Some of the things we divide over as families. Some of the things we divide over as friends. Don't even make any sense. When God has called us to be united in peace as a church. But so the first sphere is our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the most important relationship that we will ever have. The next one is our relationship with the church. We are to be humble with one another, meek, patient, and unified, loving one another. But number three, the sphere number three is the family. And our family is our greatest ministry. I know many people have that twisted. They think it's God, church, family. It's not God, church, family. It's God, family, and the church. Our greatest ministry is at home. And sometimes our greatest ministry receives the most neglect. We get tired. We get busy. The kids have activities. We have to get to the church. We get distracted. But we must understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, our first ministry is at home. It makes no sense for you to come to church and try to disciple everybody if you're not discipling people at home. We need to make saving our households our number one priority. I believe that we can do that. Discipling our family. I want, I want you to get this. Discipling our families is our most important ministry. Because charity, it starts at home. So we have our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our relationship with the church. Our relationship with our family. But lastly, we have our relationship with in the world. We have relationships in the world. We have relationships when we go to work. See, if you continue to read Ephesians 6, Paul addresses how we should relate in the world. When you read it, Paul speaks of what it means to be a slave and a slave holder. When Paul, he's not saying that slavery was a good thing in our country, but he's using it to teach us a lesson. And he says simply, slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Now, we must understand that we are servants of God. He is our master and we are to respect and fear our Lord. He goes on to say, serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. We are to serve sincerely. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. 
As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm and though as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do. Whether we are slaves or free, masters treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same masters, master in heaven. and He has no favorites. So when we really look at this, he's telling us how we should respond in the world. Because some of us are workers and some of us are bosses. There's a way that we have to conduct ourselves as disciples in the world. We have to work as if we're working for the Lord. We have to work with enthusiasm, just like we should be working for the Lord. We should be putting our full effort into our work. Why? Because that is our testimony. Have you ever, have you ever been on your job where somebody declared that they are a child of God and they loaf all the time? They are not a good example of a disciple in the world because God has called us to work diligently and to work hard for him. If we are workers, if we are bosses, he is calling us to be fair and to continue to work hard in our fairness. As believers of Christ, we have to ask ourselves, what does the holiness of God look like in our lives in this phase? We have to submit to God and we have to submit to those in authority. We have to have a godly focus, even at work. And we walk in the holiness of God. We work in the holiness of God. We move in the holiness of God. We work in the excellence of God. If we're going to talk the talk, even on our jobs, we have to walk the walk. We have to have a made up mind to work in excellence. Doing our work in excellence gives all the glory back to God. We have to do the will of God as we work. We have to work with enthusiasm. Like I stated before, those in authority must treat people respectfully. We as leaders must treat people respectfully. In the church, we must treat people respectfully. At home, we must treat people respectfully. At, and on our jobs, we must treat people respectfully and submit to the authority of God while we continue to do what God has called us to do. And remember that we have the same God. So we must understand as disciples, we, we must understand what it means to be men and women of the faith. We have to strive to have a growing faith. We must be fearless to the things that oppose God and focus on the things that please God. We must regularly internalize, process, and pre be preparing ourselves for the work that God is calling for us to do. We are to be diligent in our perfect preparation and our work. We are to be devoted to God. We are not supposed to be devoted to the accolades of man. We need to be seeking to become complete and better servants of the most high God. We need to be striving to be fearless, focused, and fruitful as we work. And we commit ourselves to sincerely share the faith no matter where we are. So Paul tells us in this sphere, we are to work and not be lazy. We are to be sincere and gracious. We are to walk with integrity. We are to live right. We are to love right. We are to walk right. We are to walk in love, even on our jobs. Because sometimes people will rub us the wrong way. But we are still to walk in love. We are to be ethical and consistent as we strive to be disciplers in our homes, in our churches, and in our workplace. And all of that is based off our relationship with Jesus Christ. So no one today, if we're going 
to be disciples and disciplers. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Leaders must be authentic, transparent, walking in integrity. We have to be focused on our relationship with Jesus Christ and be committed and devoted to growing it on a daily basis. We must grow the relationships in our churches, being humble, being meek, being patient and moving in love. We must focus on our families because our families are our first ministry. And we must focus on being diligent workers in the workplace. So we let our light shine so others might see our good works and give God all the glory. So I hope this summary helps you out on today. On next week, we'll be moving in a different direction when it comes to discipleship. But if you have any questions, concerns, or anxieties, feel free to contact me. You all have a blessed day. I will be